So Terry Hightower has graciously consented to uh, speak in his place. I would, you know, give you the uh, introduction to him again, but uh, I looked at his biographical uh, sketch that is in this book, and it really hasn't changed all that much uh, this week. It's, it's, he has not lost his voice. I have another wife now. <laughs> well, change the wife or what? <laughs> That might work too. If you keep looking at this on the internet later, I'm in trouble. <laughs> well, so how would we tell the difference? <laughs> What's different? Uh, David's topic was atheistic ethics, and are ethics possible uh, without God possible? Uh, I, I think uh, Terry's going to speak on Venus flytraps. <laughs> Or something with with that, uh, but again, I you know I, I'm very grateful that that uh, uh, Terry uh, consented to do this. Uh, if he didn't consent to do it, then I was going to have to do it. <clears throat> so there's two of us that are, are grateful to Terry. Three. <laughs> <laughs> I can see your point, <laughs> but uh, we're very uh, grateful to Terry, and, and uh, he will treat the subject very thoroughly, and so uh, Terry comes to speak to us. I didn't ask about this, but since I've only got one check, maybe we could pass this down this side and, and then, you know, doing double duty here. You know. <laughs> Labor is worthy of his hire, right? Well, okay, yeah. See how little comes back, right? Like that preacher passed it all out, came back, and he had put five dollars in it, and he, you know, he had his own five dollars, and that was it. And he said, "I was lucky to get my own hat back too, from these brethren." So, you know, <laughs> atheistic ethics or ethics without God possible. Uh, we wish uh, David Brown uh, Godspeed in recovering uh, from this uh, illness. I don't know whether he's has the courage or feels like uh, well enough to be watching uh, on the internet, but we do wish him uh, well and know you'll be praying for his uh, quick uh, recovery. Atheistic ethics are ethics without uh, God possible. There's a woman who, by the name of Wendy Northcutt who has been cataloging some really egregious, really gross uh, examples of human stupidity and what she calls her Darwin Awards. A Pennsylvania man refused to go to the hospital after being bitten by a cobra, choosing to go to a bar where he finished three drinks before dying from the poison from the cobra. A Ukrainian fisherman ran electrical cables from his house into the river in order to electrocute the fish. But then he waded into the river to collect the fish without removing the cable and thus electrocuting himself. A Florida salesman crashed and died while he was reading his sales manual. He was reading his sales manual while he was driving 80 miles an hour on Interstate 95. Of course, he, he's dead too. Northcutt's Darwin Award winners, if you want to put that one up, the first one there, uncover it if you would. She very wryly uh, makes a comment here uh, that concerning these winners of her awards here, called, she calls them the Darwin Awards, uh, she says this, uh, that the winners contrive to eliminate themselves from the gene pool in such an extraordinarily idiotic manner that their action ensures the long-term survival of our species, which now contains one less idiot. Well, in a way, I thought this would be pretty good to use this uh, because it, to lead off in this uh, study here concerning atheistic ethics or ethics without God possible. Obviously, she's studying for us, if she really believes this, uh, an ethical viewpoint even in that statement. 
But notice that it's weaved into it, though, about their action ensures the long-term survival of our, of our species, which now contains one less idiot. Well, if you just take the first part there, that the action ensures the long-term survival of our species, that's really what it's all about. That's all you really have you know, if you just have nature. Uh, I remember Brother Warren in one debate, uh, the Warren Barnhart debate. I went in and picked up David's copy, so I obviously didn't have mine really with me. But it's on page 215, and Brother Warren has, of course, numerous charts as usual in this book. If you haven't read this, bought this, and really devoured it like his other debates, you need to do that. It was on utilitarian ethics. Uh, it's on Christian ethics versus utilitarian ethics. And what you'll see in this book is just what David's chapter has boiled down into one chapter for uh, this uh, book that has been produced here by the Spring Congregation. And when you read this, uh, and this happened to be flipping through, and I noticed uh, that uh, one chart says, the egoistic hedonism of Jeremy Bitham, one of Brother Warren's charts, and uh, he has the top of it, and it says nature. And, this, and he's just quoting now from Jeremy Bentham, whom uh, this man uh, Barnhart, Joe E. Barnhart, you know, with a doctor's degree in philosophy and everything, what he was affirming was Jeremy Bentham's uh, uh, ethical standard. And, he, and of course, he, uh, Bentham said, nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters. Guess what those are? Pain and pleasure. Well, there it is. Pain and pleasure. And so uh, that is what is to, you know, you of course try to avoid pain, obviously. Some of these people with the Darwin Ward didn't quite catch on, I guess, to this ethical standard. Uh, but uh, the fact is, but the Warren puts a little notice out here to the side and said, question, what is nature? Yeah, that's what I'd like to ask. What is nature and what out of nature would tell you what is right or wrong? Nature. What is nature? Brother Warren rightfully called on him, you see, to explain to us and tell us, even using Bentham's definition, it doesn't matter, but to explain nature and to keep himself out of uh, harm's way in the sense of uh, contradictions. And, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Barnhart could not do that, as Brother Warren so readily showed. Uh, and he just ended up putting at the bottom, talking about each individual is placed under this, in essence, a god of nature about pleasure and pain, this doctrine plainly implies that a man is motivated only and completely by his own pleasure, which we know that to be false. I'm going to touch on that and some of the things that I try uh, to uh, present uh, today. Notice, as we said here, but is the continuance of the species by the two principles of random mutation and natural selection, the be-all and the end-all? Hey, that's all they've got, folks. That's really it. It's a random mutation and, and then a natural selection. And, of course, they never will stay with their doctrine of the survival of the fittest. Uh, David goes in, in his material, and numerous times in his chapter, uh, he, uh, of course, is stressing the fact that there is a universal, immutable, objective, absolute, and, and humanly attainable ethical standard. I'm glad he put that last part in there. It's on his very first page that it is something humanly attainable. Uh, most of us are locked into the, the position, and correctly so, that, of course, without uh, God, ethics, you cannot be consistent with it. We're going to touch on the fact that we're saying uh, that, yes, they have ethics. But why? What is it grounded in? What is the what we call in philosophy the instantiation? It's sort of like just think of it. What is it finally plugged into? And since David mentioned this throughout his manuscript numerous times, as you'll see, if you haven't read it yet, be sure and study through uh, his material there. Uh, but I just went out, and, and I just got some, some stuff here. In fact, this is just dirt. I'm going to have to take my word for it, maybe, but some of you can see a little bit of it here. Uh, what out of this, this cup full here, or cup of dirt that I have in here, if you can kind of hear it, you noticed the other night I'm kind of in for you get to hear things, you know. I have to wake some of these preachers up uh, to help them out stay awake, you know. But the fact is, what, what out of this spoonful or, or partial spoonful of dirt here 
How do I get right or wrong out of that? Now, there it is. That's it in a nutshell. And yet, they can come up with these really slick presentations. If you don't uh, haven't read in these things, like the Warren Barnhart debate, and studied a little bit in philosophy, but if you just back up and think a little bit, uh, you know, you know better than this. Is the continuance of the species, is that the most important thing? Is that a value in and of itself? Uh, that, you know, as long as we can continue our genes or chromosomes. Uh, many of you preachers already know this, but some others might not, or some who might be listening, so I'm just going to mention it. But there's been a recent book out by some of these people in which they're trying to be consistent, in which they have justified, ladies, are you listening? They have justified rape because of a man's genes. They're not talking about his blue genes. They're talking about is G-E-N-E-S, and so it's in, in him to continue this, and that some guys, you know, are kind of homely, like Gene Hill, I don't know. and they're needy. Really, this is what they say. I'm gonna, Gene knew I was going to work him in, you know, sooner or later. Uh, he, he, he deserves it, by the way, uh, for things I'll tell you about afterwards if you'll ask me. Uh, but anyway, he knows one of the main ones I've told a few of you about. But anyway, it's a, it's a thing where uh, supposedly some men just can't relate to women that well, and they're kind of homely, and they don't, you know, don't know how to date, don't know what to, how to dress, how to look good, comb their hair, brush their hair, whatever. And so it ends up, that is why in their chromosomal makeup, there's such a thing, including, of course, obviously your testosterone. Uh, there might be a little bit of truth to that, but push, pushing the man... Uh, to the point that he grabs a woman and takes her and rapes her. Well, are we going to start letting people off then for that? Uh, or is it still wrong? Why can't you just say, well, it was in my genes, it was in my chromosomes, you know, instead of saying like Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it, you just say, my chromosomes urged me and pushed me on, and I just couldn't help myself. There she was, I grabbed her. And, and that, because I've got to continue my, the Bible would say, got to continue my seed here. Well, think about that. And this is where all of these things obviously uh, really end up uh, winding up uh, and going way beyond what these people can even start uh, to stay with. Uh, you know, some of these things really do uh, count. I have this in some of my chapter uh, about uh, the moral argument and so forth. You remember that like uh, Aldous Huxley, many have leaped to accept the theory of macroevolution because, in other words, nature in effect, because they desire to be rid of the moral restraints of religion. In fact, he said, it interferes with my sex life. That's what he said. Well, at least he's more honest than most of them, right, to just flat out say what the situation is. Uh, the, there's an emotional attachment that these people have, especially like Richard Dawkins that was mentioned in the uh, speech earlier and in some other speeches, uh, and a man by the name of Dennett and several others, these so-called new atheists. They have an emotional attachment uh, to their situation. And, of course, they try to act like we're the only ones, that we're strange, we're eccentric, you know, that we're the ones who uh, are weird. But I'll tell you what Jesus tells us. Let's just go, bring this back to the Bible to kind of keep our feet on the ground for a minute. But look at Matthew 5 and verse 45. I decided to use that one verse and have you look at it. Uh, Jesus says there in, in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. But in Matthew 5, 45, uh, he says that ye may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the, now look at it, the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and whom? The unjust. There is such a thing according to Jesus. And as you well know, each one here perhaps subscribes to this, as do I, that Jesus is the very epitome of explaining that and walking and talking and living on this earth as a human ought to live. You want to see, how would God live if he were to be a human? Folks, we already know. It's in the form of Jesus Christ. He's shown us. He lived it. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. There is such a thing as sin. It is a transgression. Uh, 
uh, of God's law, 1 John 3 and verse 4, Romans 4 and verse 15. And why I mention those verses is because you have an anchor point with it, which as Brother Warren showed in this debate and in the other ones also with these atheists, they have no place to ground their ethics. They have no place to go. Are you going to go out here and stick it in a pile of dirt here and say, there's my ethics, that's where it came from. It grew out of that dirt in the bottom of uh, Terry Hightower's little cup here that he's got a spoon stuck in, uh, into. Uh, think about that. That's really just a, a little bit of meditation on these things, and you see uh, what the problem you know, uh, really is. Go to the next one, if you would. I just want to show you kind of on their side of it, like I did, I guess, in my other speech a little bit, but this fits right in with the last speech that you've heard. We've got the geologic uh, uh, ages and events here. Now, do you understand, this is not theirs. This is the one I've got for you and going to explain a little bit. But you'll notice time in the left-hand side. I'm asking, when did morality evolve? Uh, where? We can ask about a Venus flytrap. We can ask about the echolocation of a bat radar. They just, in, you know, came up with that and evolved it, supposedly. A dolphin has radar. Uh, you know, if we're about 200, 230 feet away, it can spot a fish about the size of a golf ball with that radar. And I go into all that of teleology, but in essence, we're doing the same thing. We're just talking about morality or values now. And David has some great definitions of these of the terms, such as absolute, objective, and so on. And again, I mentioned humanly attainable. I'm so glad that he put that in there because I think we run into some members of the church, you know, that they don't read passages correctly uh, on a lot of verses sometimes. And I think some of my own, even preaching brethren, I've found out in some discussions with them, uh, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Brethren, that verse doesn't say for all have to sin because you're fallible and you're finite and you're going to have to just sin. It does not say that. Jesus, number one, is proof if he was really a human. Was he? We heard a speech on that proving that he was. He is human. Did he sin? No, therefore you do not have to sin. Did he freely choose not to sin? That's actually the case. He has built us with free will. But sometimes we get to reading verses, and I know kind of where you're coming from, certainly. What we should say is that when a person lives long enough, then they do, and they're accountable, they do sin. But it's not because they have to. So don't read Romans 3.23. Do not read that verse that all have to sin because you're finite and human, and we're all weak. And I know what we're saying sometimes in prayer about that and so forth. But we need to be careful with it because it's crucial to answering all this. Well, let's have a little fun with this. You'll notice here, uh, these are millions of years. We've got the era of the epoch. We've got life forms. And I'm just going to go ahead and we're starting up here with, uh, with rocks, you know, rather than just strictly uh, dirt here. So, uh, well, we're going we're gonna to evolve morality. But then we get it, you suppose, from the life form of just a, a rock here. Well, I'm going to get my pointer. I don't think it's going to work. There it goes, uh, and, and so forth. Some of these things are just some funny statements here. We come on down. Uh, this, is the, this is the first geologic uh, period it's called Precocious. The first one underneath it is Catatonic. No offense meant to anybody in here but the word Catatonic. Uh, I hope all of, you, maybe all of you don't know what that means or what that has to do with it. Anyway. Okay, prophylactic, and that's not a vulgar term either. Uh, I, I hope you know that. But notice here we've got green with an M, slime. You know, sort of indicating we're making some slight, these little slight changes and adjustments in the evolutionary process, you know, little step by step, unless you do like someone mentioned last time about, the, you know, punctuated equilibrium and the great jump that you mentioned, uh, Kenneth. Well, here's, we finally get to this one, green slime with orange spots on it. And then we have the orthopedic, uh, again, I'm not going to call names looking out across this crowd. Orthopedic, and under this, the accordion, uh, the pedestrian, the Freudian. That's just slimy things, by the way. This was seashells. This is more seashells. And the Freudian era, slimy things. Artesian, slimy things with tentacles. Uh, the uh, the test of first, first is nasty, crawly things. And then you have uh, obstreperous 
which is lots of nasty crawling things. Uh, and then you come to the metatarsal, which is the one I wanted to get to, the cryptic, and you have big warty things. Then you have the styptic period, uh, which is really big warty things, you know, like your mother-in-law. And then you come to the creosote period. Creosote, I'm wondering, when, when, did, when did value, when did real right and wrong evolve? When did it happen? Has it happened so far? Uh, I mean, you do this with the, uh, the actual one, like was mentioned uh, by Brother John West a while ago, concerning it is only in the books where they put geologic columns together, and it's only in a book. It's not any place out here you can go look and say, there they are, lined up, and just read them, you know, right off. Well, uh, notice in the creosote one, that's the warty things uh, too big to start over. Maybe that'll include some of this punctuated equilibrium or something, you know, some great giant uh, jumps or something, or at least you have to start over. And then notice there's the, the cretinous, and underneath that one you have the obscene period, and that's uh, little hairy animals. And then you have the ugly scene period, that's big hairy animals, you know, like Lynn Parker with a bikini on. <laughs> Uh, and then you have the Vaseline period, Vaseline, uh, animals with silly horns. You have the Listerine period, animals that don't understand about tar pits. They don't understand about tar pits. Ovaltine, where you have not tree shrews, but this is correct, it's shree trues. And then Plasticine were the first homonyms. And then more recently, 25,000 years ago down here at the bottom, uh, you have the first modern person, and then right after that, the first Republicans. And then, and then at the very bottom down here, you know, maybe 15 minutes, anyway, very recent, you have computer nerds, you know, like Daniel Cove and Michael Hatcher. Oh, there's, there's a bunch of you out here. I've seen you operating upstairs here today. Well, what we're saying, we're having a little fun with this, but you just think about this and take their own charts of time, and think, when did value arrive? When did it get here? And I'm, I'm assuring you, just like we were laughing about some of this, but they cannot answer that and be consistent. They're always going to be uh, contradictory. Go to the next one, if you would. This thing does get serious. Uh, I think I put this in, perhaps in my chapter. Uh, concerning it is a very serious thing. This will affect your everyday life. And uh, uh, I would say this, that as a, before I go to that, uh, the, once upon a time there was a hare, H-A-R-E, uh, a rabbit in other words, a philosophical temperament and who invited a politically oriented fox to dinner. And during the entree, the hare, H-A-R-E, presented uh, an interesting argument on the relativity of all law and morals, uh, stressing that each beast in the final analysis, he said, has a right to his own legal system. And the fox, of course, did not find this argument entirely convincing on an intellectual level, but was much impressed with it practically. For dessert, he ate the hare la peen a la cream. And the moral here then is what? One's philosophical viewpoint can be of immense practical consequence. And when you take the atheistic position, you have no place to anchor your values in. There's no place in which it is really what we're saying. It doesn't fit reality. It turns into a subjective thing, as David has so well shown. You'll see that as you read through his uh, chapter. Well, uh, the, that rabbit or hare kind of found out the stakes. Maybe we ought to spell that S-T-E-A-K-S. It's when the stakes are pretty high when it's your life on the line here. And you can spout off like many will do in philosophy classes, uh, and, and yet we need to, to uh, dig deeper. We need to see how even one well-placed question, Brother Warren certainly taught that all of his life, one well-placed question uh, at the, exactly the right time and place, if you know what you're doing, can just totally turn a whole classroom and a situation around. The teacher may not be happy, by the way, when you do that, uh, but we should still do it. It's what we're talking about here, contending for what? 
the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. Uh, a man by the name of Paul Copan points out, here's a good rule, and I agree with this wholeheartedly, here's a good uh, rule of thumb about morality. Don't believe people who say murder or rape may not really be wrong. And I give you some things in my chapter uh, about that under the moral uh, argument uh, concerning some people who try that. And, and if you know what you're doing, as Paul Copan showed there, uh, you can turn this situation around and get them to see, uh, even though they, they'll oppose uh, things about themselves or their own children. I don't know how many times, but numerous times whenever I've been attending classes uh, under a certain professor or whatever, and they get off on all this, everything is relative, there are no absolute stuff, and so forth. You just raise your hand, and you may be kind of quivering a little bit, folks, sometimes. Uh, some of us don't that much. But anyway, raise your hand. I know what the feeling is when you have a whole class hostile sometimes. And you say, Dr. So-and-so, under what you said, all things are, are relative. There is no absolute right or wrong about anything. And I say, under what conditions could you, because I've been taking notes, and I'll write down about his family, or I've tried to find out about that before I ever got in there. And you say, under what conditions could you rape and murder your own three-year-old daughter? And it'll be as quiet as it is right now in here. He may not like it. <laughs> But even if he turns and tries to be consistent and he says, uh, okay, here's the conditions if I could save the world. You know, one guy was trying it the other night in that debate, if you saw it with Kyle Butt. Did you see that? <laughs> uh, get, get that. I guess they've archived it where you can watch it. It was unbelievable some of the things that he was willing to claim. I, I, I wrote in and couldn't get it, of course, to Kyle, but... Uh, I want him to ask, instead of just about a girl out here, in which he's saying he could, to save the whole world, he could, he could, you know, rape this girl. Well, make it his own daughter. Make it some of us, some, some other human, some other men, raping his wife, and then pin it down. Especially if his wife's sitting right there in class. And that, then they will move to absolutes. You can always move them to absolutes. That's why Paul Copan is correct in talking about the good rule of thumb about morality is don't believe people, you know, who say anything goes. They don't believe that, as we've shown, many of you have shown in your, these other speeches that are, and so forth, the material in this book. Don't you worry, boy, they believe in absolutes. They'll absolutely put a fundamentalist, so-called fundamentalist Christian in jail for you even talking bad about homosexuality or lesbianism or things like that. We've all said that it's coming, and it is coming. It's not because they don't hold a law. They do hold the, uh, a law. And they, in fact, now they're working to get, actually get it to where they can, uh, uh, you know, it, put it in operation or in effect to enforce it. Enforce it. Canada and other, some European countries have already, as you know, uh, doing some of that. But the fact is, again, if you want to have a little fun with them sometimes, and maybe not use their wife or daughter so much, well, you are using the wife on this one, you can ask them, Right after hearing them, an atheist pontificate about the relativity of, of morals. Now, it's always kind of fun to ask them if adultery is the moral thing, can be the moral thing to do, like I said, especially if his wife, his spouse is there, you know, or his child especially is present. They may not be present, of course, I realize in a college class, so you just have to say, you would go home and you would teach your child, you know, that adultery and so on, and certain things are, are okay. How about incest? Don't worry, they got their line here if you just stay with it, and they have to then. Uh, they're coming over with us, but why is that? I'll tell you why it is. It's not because of this dirt-type theory here uh, of where you get value from. It's because God has so stamped it, stamped it on them of being made in his image that they are moral beings and they simply cannot escape from that. And they're always going to be, that's where it actually comes from, despite all of their protestations to the, you know, to the contrary and, and uh, going uh, the other uh, way with it. Well, the typical atheistic view of good and evil is inadequate. It's not, as we're saying here, it's not able to explain the glories of human goodness or, uh, on one hand, or the shamefulness of, of human evil. You have both in the Bible, don't you? You have the situation where uh, the Bible teaches 
some things that we look at David, a man after what? God's own what? Heart. And yet, does he do some horrid, evil things? Yes. But what explains it? I say it is explained, and biblically certainly, by that God has given us this gift of free will, which makes actions uh, meaningful. Uh, he has given us what? Think about it. Free will. You know, all the passages that we use about, you know, the, the, the prophet or whoever, the gospel preacher, choose you this day uh, who, which God you will serve. Well, I'm going to say you can either serve dirt like this, in effect, and say this is where I originated. Like I mentioned, of course, in the book there, someone mentioned that, you know, uh, from goo to you by way of the zoo. Uh, and, and you can say that's where I came from. And then somewhere along the line, I don't know how to exactly explain it, but we got right and wrong. Or you can say God made us in his image. We go back to dust like this. But there is a soul or spirit. There is our actual entity uh, that will live on forever. I think we need to see that uh, what's, what we're talking about here is something that really does count. It not only really counts in this life, but certainly it's going to count in the afterlife. Do you know that your soul or spirit, ever since it was created at the moment of conception, Zechariah 12 and verse 1 and uh, Ecclesiastes 12, other verses teaching this, uh, where the soul or spirit will depart to the God who made it. Zechariah 12 gives us a little bit more, I think, uh, 1, chapter 12, verse 1, a little more detail about God implanting, you know, the spirit here, and that he makes the spirit. Uh, humans do not. Uh, but the fact is, uh, think about it this way. Ever since your soul or spirit was created at the point of conception, you will live now as long as God is going to live. You think about that. Boy, when you start looking at, at an afterlife and a possibility of punishment or divine retribution, uh, which is another whole fallacy, I'll try to get to some of the material I have ready to, to uh, give. But let me just mention it here. Uh, what's the enforcer of this dirt theory, of this nature theory? What's the enforcement? Uh, where's Hitler right now? They have to say he went, all of him went back to dust. There is no uh, weighing of the scales here and saying Hitler did all these evil things. He really got away with it, given their viewpoint in a sense, didn't he? He is not in any pain, no, no feeling, none of, because there's nothing past inert or really non-living. Some people say dead. That may imply that it was alive and then died, so maybe it is better to say, like Flu said, say non-living matter. But who, who's going to enforce this? There is no one. There is nothing about it. Which I'm saying, your whole human humanity and the makeup of a human cries out against that kind of thing and says, it is not fair. Well, it's not just that we invented God, you know, and made God in our own minds. But the question is, is that reality or not? Humans are different from anything we see in other, uh, even other living things, much less this dirt uh, on earth. When we're good, uh, what, uh, there's a little poem or a little story about this, about the little girl. When we're good, she said, we're very, very good. But when we're bad, we're horrid. And we are. But what is good? What is horrid? What, what will flesh that out? And if you give up on the Bible, you have given up on the actual answer totally from Genesis 1 verse 1 through the last verse of Revelation 22. Uh, atheism cannot really explain this thing of, of uh, right and wrong and the reality of it. It is real. They cannot go through life without it, uh, being forced to see, if you know what you're doing again, that it is something that's real. Atheism cannot really explain this, as David shows uh, numerous ways there and throughout his chapter. Uh, how did such a wildly unpredictable, unstable species evolve to be so different than everything else? And I'm here to tell you that it's the moral thing that is really, I'm going to say, numero uno. We obviously don't really look like God. We always teach that to the kids to point out, you know, it's not that we're made in his image in some strict physical sense. Uh, maybe that ought to be studied a little more. But, but it's, in a, it's in this moral, it's a morality thing. 
I would say the basic thing biblically from my study of it is it's, uh, that we are creatures even at the point of conception apparently and we will live on forever as I already said as long as God's spirit is alive so will ours which means of course eternity it brings to mind that song about we've been there 10,000 years do we have any left days uh -uh. but the fact is is that the, the a, a child even Apparently, according to Scripture, I believe, when you study this out, the Im being made in the image of God is primarily to do with ha being able to have fellowship with other sentient beings and primarily God. Fellowship. That's what the church is a great deal about, isn't it? It's fellowship. Uh, but sometimes you'll hear some preacher or somebody say, well, you know, uh, why did God make man? Well, and they kind of make out it's almost like to say God. I've heard a few people say it. God's lonely, so he made man. He's not lonely. He didn't need man. He had a fellowship. What's it called? Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Think of all your preachers. You think of those charts that you preached, and you're right about it. And it was a fellowship. Paul lays it out in Acts chapter 17, and of course uh, makes the basic uh, point there, that God is not like a human at least in this sense, that, in, that uh, you know, that though he, he needed to be served by men's hands, verse 25, back 17, uh, as though he needed any anything, as though he did, he, he didn't need anything. He freely chose to make us, and we're in his image if you're accountable, because you can freely choose action A or not action A. And then there is significance to that, because their Calvinists are dead wrong about it, they take away the significance of the action of a human in there, especially if you're a strong, what we call a strong Calvinist. Uh, but uh, the fact is, he didn't need anything, as though he needed anything, Paul says, seeing he himself giveth to all life and breath and all things. Uh, well, again, we're not, they're not able to explain the glories of human goodness about a human and the makeup of human beings or the shamefulness of human evil. And number two here, uh, they are not able to explain why we should prefer certain behaviors over others. Barnhart couldn't do it with other Warren, and neither could Flew, neither could Matson, uh, and then many other uh, discussions that have been had since then. It just simply doesn't fit what we know about right and wrong. Most of us know that molesting little children is not merely an undesirable activity, because it introduces the instability into the community of our species. You know, that's what some of them have actually said. It introduces instability into, well, you know, you think that bothered Hitler about Jews and little Jewish children? He didn't care. Uh, well, we in fact know that in itself it's a despicable, horrible act to molest a little child. And, 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 you know, and talking about the evil of mankind, you know, and I don't want to gross anybody out here, but sometimes you have to use this on some of these college professors who are so glib in their speaking. Uh, but just the fact is, you know, that some little babies have actually had venereal diseases of the mouth, and you know where they got it from. You let that sink in. Well, <clears throat> why is this so? Why should it be so? If we are merely another evolved animal species, this is uh, very difficult to understand, isn't it? Just as difficult to understand why so many males, and I'll say that because it primarily is males, males, not all of it maybe, but most of it, of our species do it. It's in my genes. Uh, and that's what, that's what uh, Richard Dawkins actually you know, ha has also really said. Uh, it's, it's doing the, the dance according to your chromosomes or, or your genes. Well, imagine him accepting Hitler's explanation of that. Similarly, most of us understand that rescuing children or old people from a burning building is not just a, a boon for our species. And we, in fact, know that such actions really are good, uh, period. Just period. It's a good act. God has so stamped that on us, and you do not even, like Paul says in Romans 2, 14 and 15, you do not even have to have a Bible, a written word anyway, to know things like that are, are true. Uh, murder, rape, lying, certainly running away in battle. C.S. Lewis and others have well documented uh, uh, much of that. But just understand this, the origin of morals or ethics is plainly contradictory 
to atheistic tenets. That's what David's chapter goes through step by step and showing. And we're not suggesting that, be careful here now, we're not suggesting that atheists cannot do good actions or do good things. They can and they often do so. Oh, they get upset. I've had some upset where that you thought they were going to blow up in a class or something. But the fact is, atheism cannot, as a philosophy, do a good job of explaining why people should do good things and shouldn't do bad things. It cannot explain it as a philosophy because it has no ground place. No, It's just a free, imagine a building, and no anchor point whatsoever. Well, when they do good things or they refrain from the bad, uh, then they are merely reflecting, as we've already pointed out, the image of God in them. No atheist has ever explained how an impersonal, amoral initial cause through a random amoral process has produced a moral basis for human life, while at the same time denying any objective moral basis for good or evil. That's really all they have. As Dave Hunt reminded us, there are no morals in nature. I'm going to hold this up again and make you think about it. I hope you'll come back to this. I, I'm not worried about that. If I die and just go back to dust like this, I'm feeling no pain. That's all that a lot of people want, apparently even some unfaithful members of the church. Well, no morals in nature. Try to find, as he says, a compassionate crow or an honest eagle or a sympathetic hurricane. It's just not there, folks. And then as we quote Richard Dawkins here, are we just dancing to the music of our DNA like Richard Dawkins claims? I say, and you know that you're not, and you know this from Scripture. We'll have to end here. But I think of the numerous verses of Scripture Perhaps 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 uh, is very appropriate here, uh, given uh, David's uh, topic here that he, of course, was dealing with. Atheistic ethics are ethics without God possible. Uh, here's what it ends up, not like this, with no enforcement whatsoever, no explanation for the makeup of humankind, really, but a pure non-absolute relative situation, uh, a situation ethics thing is all you're going to have. But here's what the Bible says, what Paul, of course, points out. For we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he hath done, whether it be good or what? Bad. And the Bible, that's what the Bible is about. It's giving us the details. It even gives us not only uh, direct statements of how we ought to live and act and think, but it also even gives examples. It even gives a pattern in the life of Christ of how we can know then that we are living uh, correctly. I'm not saying from my earlier remarks, don't go out of here saying that I said, you know, anything other than it is possible to live without sin. Let me ask this. Did you have to commit the very first sin you ever committed after you became amenable? Did you have to do it? That's the point. You didn't. But well, we fall back on this, say, well, you sin, I sin, everybody sin sins. And so, you know, you kind of get it mixed into the crowd and you sort of justify whatever it is. Uh, well, I only do this these two or three sins. I'm not like so-and-so. Well, the Bible speaks to that, of course, of measuring yourself by yourself or other mere humans instead of measuring yourself against Jesus Christ. It'll change around. In Acts 17, uh, we'll close with this. The times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked. The verse right before that, he says, We ought not to think of the Godhead as like unto gold or silver or stone or a graven by or dirt. It's even worse in some ways. Uh, graven by the art and device of men. The times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked. But now he commandeth what? He commandeth men that they should all everywhere repent. Inasmuch as he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained, uh, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. There it is. That's what the Bible is about, centering on the life and death and the resurrection also of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. You cannot be consistent. You cannot stay with it. You cannot consistently, without getting into all sorts of contradictions, try to sustain a view other 
than the infinite, eternal God who made everything that exists other than himself. I hope again to urge you to study through uh, Brother David Brown's uh, chapter here. And, uh, and we'll end with this. Don't go out and get a Darwin Award. Think. Think. I'm skipping all kinds of some visuals I had here. Use that noggin power. Use that gray matter. My mother used to call it, you know, use your noggin, Terry. <laughs> use your noggin. Use your intellectual facilities that God has built into you because you're accountable because of that, of looking at evidence and drawing the right conclusion, and you can do that here. Nature will not suffice. It's just that thing. You know, a couple of the basic uh, tenets of evolution. One is that uh, things are progressing or are developing from the simple to the more complex. And uh, another principle of uh, evolution is that there is no purpose in evolution. It has no aim. It has no objective. It just is what it is. Uh, that being the case, what is the purpose of humans, and it's unique to humans, having uh, a concept of right and wrong, or a concept of good and evil, a concept of sin? Uh, Evolution will not uh, accommodate those concepts. So where do they come from? They had to come from something other, other than evolution. Uh, another thing that is puzzling, at least to me, and I'm sure to others also, is uh, for atheists, why, are, why, why do atheists get so mad about the fact that there are those who accept that there is a deity, a god? If there is no God to them, what does it matter? Uh, or evolutionists, why do they get so mad? Why are they so insistent that we embrace their view of origins and how things came into being? Uh, what does it matter to them? If evolution is in fact true, whether we uh, adopt that view or a view of creation, it, 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 it does not matter. As we say in, in Texas and probably maybe Alabama too, <laughs> Uh, anyway, we say that you know they get so mad they could stomp baby ducks. Yeah. Now, why is that? Oh, I forgot that Johnny's here from California. We have to use a different term. <laughs> they're, they're madder than a homosexual at a prop eight rally. <laughs> <laughs> but why? If it's just a pure chance and it's not going to matter to them because it's still going to happen whether we accept it or don't accept it. But the fact of the matter, it is a reality. Good and evil is a reality. They are realities. Uh, they must be explained. They cannot be explained by uh, evolutionary processes or atheistic principles. So I appreciate again, Terry, your uh, good work in this area and the fact that you stepped up the plate to, to uh, carry David's load. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to,